Very good. We're going to uh, kick it off right away here today. Um, actually, I should look and see what this has now been uh, been titled. It's a slight <laughs> change from, from what was out there. And so people might be asking, uh, what are these two gentlemen doing on the stage to, uh, together? From, from my, my simple pattern recognition brain, which is probably far less powerful than most of you here in the room, you know, over lunch I learned that within 48 hours of the Pacific Research Platform is being funded by the NSF, uh, Simon's colleagues in Australia had called to say they would be users of the, of the PRP. And then uh, over lunch, I also learned that now Larry is putting solar on his home and distributed power. And so I figured out that the conductor of the big data superhighway and the conductor of the new energy superhighway are now connected once again today. So that's what we're going to be talking about. Uh, to begin this, I think I would, uh, I'll, I'll pose uh, what I think a lot of people believe is that we, we have two really good networks. Um, that have been created. The internet running for about 40 years plus and the energy um, network, which is over 100 years old at this point in time. And so, you know, as we think about them, should we think of them as really robust systems or are these systems set up now for disruption? And if so, are there similarities between uh, the disruption that may occur? Simon, will you just uh, maybe talk to us a little bit about what's happening on the energy grid and, and what the look of so this new grid is going to be? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'll tell you a little story. And my, my background really comes from the same sort of universe that Larry's does, and we have got a lot of common kind of collaborators because I come from the internet space and from the space of a career building, building big pipes of various sorts, although Larry keeps redefining what big means. And the thing is that the internet is a new way of looking at moving information around the planet in a bi-directional way, in a way that's distributed. You know, these are intrinsic characteristics of the internet that it's distributed, the knowledge is distributed, the control is distributed, and yet somehow the concert keeps working. The energy networks, while they're old, are very much like, I guess, like in my experience, the TV networks, right? It's a big command and control situation. You've got energy that appears in large generation spaces, comes down from on high, gets moved across the country to where consumers of that energy are, and very much a one-way street. So to the extent there's control in that network, it's centrally driven control, um, either from, you know, from big generators to ultimately down to consumers, it all trickles down, it all goes in one direction. Now, there's obviously disruption happening there. It's driven by, by something that on its own is a part of the solution, but also a huge part of the problem. As you guys all appreciate, there's lots of renewables going into the energy grid for a whole lot of good reasons, right? A lot of reasons related to trying not to destroy the atmosphere on our planet. Also, increasingly, because things like solar have been deployed so extensively, they've now gone way down the volume up, cost down curve. So now they're actually getting cheaper than putting up a new, a new dirty station somewhere, which is great. But the thing about that, generated, that generation capacity, the new stuff on people's roofs, Australia is actually per capita one of the leaders in terms of solar panels on roofs, it turns out. Um, that stuff is obviously distributed, but the distribution is one set of challenges. It means the energy wants to kind of climb the other way up the pipe, so that involves some, some changes in the way the pipes work. But also, more interestingly, the control of that has one distributed command and control system at the moment, and it's called Mother Nature, and that's it. So when those solar panels turn on, when the wind blows, is up to what the atmosphere chooses to do and where the sun chooses to be in relation to the Earth at a given moment. So that energy source across a city, let's say, turns on when the sun rises. More importantly and far more difficult for an energy grid operator is that that energy turns off as much shorter term things happen than the daily cycle. As a storm rolls in across a city, as clouds suddenly pop out of the sky on a hot summer's day, that energy source turns off. And it's the fact that it turns off at short notice that puts enormous stress on existing traditional ways to generate power because they just don't spin up as fast as the clouds spin over. So we have one of the components of a distributed energy grid in existence today, which is that distributed generation of power. What we don't have are the other two pieces that turn that into a very functional, operative, distributed energy grid that is reliable, robust and stable. Because all that solar energy and all that wind farms are starting to destabilise the grid because changes in weather on a very, very short-term basis make it almost impossible to control all of the arms of that octopus from the head. Yeah? So two things are missing. That's why I've, got, why I've moved my own interests and my own involvement, my own investments from the internet space into the energy storage space is because energy storage is one of the other two missing, one of the two missing links here. If you're going to get over that intermittency in a very short time frame, you've obviously got to time shift the energy. You've got to hang on to it 
and then transmit it out later. The logical place to put that missing energy storage is right where the energy generation is. That means where you have lots of small solar panel arrays, you have lots of small batteries mirroring them. Where you've got a big concentrated solar array or a big wind farm array, you logically want to put a big grid scale set of batteries beside those things and balance one with the other. And that leads me to the third missing piece at the moment in the grid, which is decentralised intelligence, software, communication, coordination between a lot of small areas of the grid that need to make their own local decisions but also need to talk to the rest of the grid. And what I'm describing there is directly what the internet does so well. So there's a set of lessons from the 40-year history of the internet that are in the process of being overlaid, like it or not, and I like it, onto the energy grid. It's being refactored into this distributed thing. So adding batteries to solar arrays and other things is not an exercise of people all getting mad as hell and getting off the grid. It's an exercise in reframing the grid as a bi-directional backbone, very analogous to what Larry's talking about in internet space, a bi-directional energy backbone where there's distributed command control to make all of that work. So there's a few things about that looking at the energy grid side of that, and it leads to the same kind of answer in an analogous space, right? To make a distributed energy grid work, you need enough batteries, and as you've suggested, you know, Tesla are making batteries, Redflow, the company I'm part of, are making batteries, and the challenge won't be a competitive one, it'll be a matter of keeping up with demand. Exactly. Right? So you need the right battery for the right place. We think our batteries are better in a grid. You'd never put ours in a car. We actually think the car batteries don't actually work ultimately so well in a grid. Right? Right, Lithium's right. about spiky that. demand, not about workhorse. So right, you know, right thing, and absolutely you need enough supply to meet demand. At the moment it's the opposite, because the batteries are expensive. As the cost comes down, demand will outstrip supply, like the internet boom. Yeah, enormously. Second thing is that in distributed generation, you have a kind of another big data application. All of these generators of electricity in your home and in your business generated off renewable data source and energy storage. Mm -hmm. You add a whole lot of software to that, you get big generation. Mm -hmm. You wind up with virtual energy plants in a city that are bigger than the ones sitting on the edge yes. of the city, that are in fact within the city's footprint, that yes. are all of our homes, all of our rooftops, all of our businesses. That's right. Software turns that into a big programmable distributed generator. It turns consumers into potential earners of money because you have companies like Sunverge in California that are doing this, that are using software to apply to that problem so that they can say to their consumers, you can be a part of the generation income source here, not just a part of the... the you know, you can, and your, your API, your access to the, to the network can be economic, not just, yeah. not just electricity, yeah. which is a fabulous story. Now, I'm, I'm looking forward... Um, to, of course, the way they want to send you the seller cells is equal to your, you know, last year's energy consumption, right? And we'll maybe do a little bit more than that because then we're going to go in with data analysis and, and gradually get rid of the demand function inside the house and make it more and more energy efficient. And so I'm going to go from having to pay local utility $300 or $400 a month to them paying me. That's a pretty big change. <laughs> and now here's the deal. We have 50,000 houses in San Diego that have already gone solar. That's about six or 7% of the grid. When it hits 10%, the grid destabilizes, according to the experts. Yeah, without batteries. Yeah, without batteries. And so we're very near a tipping point. This is not like in the far future. This is in the next few years. One of the other things that happens, interestingly, there is that, that tension for an energy retailer, an energy supplier to a home. Do they want you to put batteries in and, use, and therefore use less energy or not? You know, is it conflicting with their commercial yeah. goals? And I'd argue that ultimately, if they're thinking about it, it's not. One of the other things we're starting to see in some communities, like the island of Orkney, north of Scotland, yeah. it turns out, that make more electricity every year from renewables than the whole island consumes, net. So they use the, the grid as a battery to do it. Yeah? Right. What they're starting to do now is move other sources of energy consumption that are not electricity, like heating oil, to electric instead. The electricity has got so cheap for them, they're moving every other source of energy requirement to electric. Right. They're heating their water electrically, con right. crucially, they're heating their homes electrically. Mm -hmm. So ultimately, the, the electricity demand for your house can actually go up. The electricity retailer can make more money by actually taking other dirty energy heat generation sources and switching them to using electricity instead. There's a really dynamic picture that builds up once the electricity gets both cheap and reliable. The batteries also make it reliable. Well, the batteries are really the critical piece yeah. right now because um, here's what I learned by talking to the utility. The really expensive long-term uh, hardware device is that transformer on the pole at the edge of your neighborhood. And that's been optimized to the amount of electricity that is used by all the houses. It takes a year or two to get another one of those, okay? 
And so every time somebody buys an electric car, that battery that comes in is like adding another house. Yep. Well, somebody says, okay, he got a Tesla. I'm going to get a Tesla. I'm going to get a Leaf. I'm gonna, you know, and before long, the power company has got to take the, bat the transformer out and completely redo it and everything. So this is a hugely disruptive thing. And that's why I'm suggesting to the power company, you want to be partnering with these early adopters and figuring out where you're going because you've got multi-year investment changes here that are huge and you're, you know, you've got regulators, you've got uh, stockholders. I mean, um, you've got to get on top of this. And so I think we're going to see, particularly in San Diego, our utility company is one of the most forward-looking in the country, they say, just reading about it, um, that I think this kind of partnering is something that's going to be a very different world when there's just this distant power company that you have nothing to do with and you sit there and some money and they send you electricity. There's also um, an, e there's an economic breakpoint beyond which the batteries turn up in even newer spots. In particular, there's an economic point at which, and it's not right now, but in five years it absolutely will be, where that electricity company, rather than upgrading the transformer, will put a battery in right underneath it to actually produce the levelling of demand, the peak shifting, right there inside their own network. Mm -hmm. So the batteries wind up appearing in lots of spots, in your home, in that kind of sub-distribution point, and right beside big generators. They wind up everywhere. It's been pretty convincing that, that this disruption is coming, and, and even seen a, a pathway to how it, how it plays out. You know, one thing I think a lot about is how, how innovations line up to allow disruption, right? And so it, it, you know, you know, the joke is, you know, Mark Anderson saying, well, software's eating the world, right? But what we're actually seeing is software ate the world, and now they're all hardware, back to hardware and driving this. I'm seeing some of the same patterns. Right. I'd be interested, just quickly, your thoughts on, you know, how does the innovation pattern drive the disruption? I yeah. think we touched Well, on. let me give you an example. Andy Beckelsheim, who ought to get some giant Nobel Prize for innovation in computing. You know, he was one of the founders of Sun Microsystems, and he did the thumpers, and then he did Arista. And you may have needed, noticed that on the thing. Well, what's Arista? It's a switch that allows, you know, you got, th think of Mark talking about flows, right? That's what I think about. This is not going to replace the internet at all. This is for a small number of people who have these big data flows that they have to deal with. Okay, so now you've got a 10 gigabit flow coming in. Another one's got another 10 gigabit. This all goes to the Arista. It can switch 576 10 gigabit flows simultaneously without blocking. Now that's a piece of hardware innovation that's just stunning. And we could not possibly be thinking about doing this otherwise. How do you terminate? Uh, you know, look, I come to your lab and I say, here's this optical fiber. Good news, you are now getting 1,000 times as much data per second into your lab as you were before. Congratulations. Yeah, Here you go. And what do I do with this thing? <laughs> Where do I plug it in? Do you have a, you know, 10 or 40 gigabit NIC in your, comp no. So what we, but we, we realize is you could just take PCs, either desk side or rack, you just optimize them for big data. So you have like a, so many terabyte of flash memory, and then you, you have, you know, maybe a terabyte of RAM, and you have very fast I.O., and then you just put a 10 or 40 gigabit optical network interface card on it, and in the back, you've got your normal Ethernet, you know, your blue CAT6 uh, gigabit Ethernet that you plug all the computers in your lab into this thing. It becomes sort of a super buffer to the, the 10 gigabits. It, it now, you have something to eat all this thumb in, and then you can actually compute on it as you go. These are like $5,000, $10,000. Please, go ahead. Yeah, just a key, key light bulb moment for me. You correctly used the word for that device, it's a buffer. Yep. Right? It's a buffer between the old world and the new world. And it's exactly what a battery does, right? It's a buffer that shifts energy in time in the same way that you have to shift energy a sm data in time a small amount to just catch the fire hose and distribute it. Well, it's, it's incredibly analogous. So I think our time is up. Um, so I apologize, but please, please meet these gentlemen. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Keep conducting these changes in the networks. <laughs>